So you're clicking on the show right now because you're probably chilling. Chilling in Cali, right? It's probably 70 degrees because it's 70 degrees every day out there, right? You're like, yo, dude, it's December. It's 70. Yo, dude, it's July. It's 70, right? That's that's what you guys all got going on there, you Bay Area folks. And I don't know. I don't know what the weather like is like in the rest of California. But I know it's really good. I know it's really good. Maybe it gets hotter than that. Maybe a little colder. I don't know. But it's real good, right? So when the weather's real good. People like to buy real estate there, right? California real estate, most expensive real estate in the world, okay? You know what's not expensive? Cleveland, Cleveland real estate. And that's why a lot of you California folks sitting in your real nice weather are watching me talk on your uh, little YouTuber there, right? Your your phone, your computer, your tablet, maybe your TV. I don't know. But uh, what y'all are looking for is cheap properties, cheap properties, cheap properties that have a lot of cash flow, right? Cash flow, that's what you're looking for, right? Because it's really hard to get a cheap property and cash flow uh, when you're in that beautiful California weather. So you come here, and guess what? You came to the right spot because ain't nobody, ain't nobody going to break down investing in Cleveland real estate, what you should really anticipate, what you should really expect, more than your boy James Wise. So if you want to learn, what it's like to buy low-income real estate in the Midwest. Let's do this. This is your show. This is the show where I work for you directly, taking your needs. I'm going through the MLS, and I'm trying to find the best possible deal for you guys. Put down 25%. That's the perfect way to buy this. That's why real estate investing is the greatest industry in the world. Welcome to the show, folks. My name is James Wise. Today I'm working with my man Chris, California investor. And Chris, brother, I got you a treat. I got you a treat, dog. And everybody else watching this video, y'all getting a treat too. Now, if your name is not Chris, well, I mean, I guess your name could be Chris, but if you're not my specific client, Chris, you need to hear this. You cannot buy this property. This property is going to be sweet. I'm going to tell you a lot of stuff wrong with it, but you still can't buy it. So if you're like, damn, I want to buy a property. I'm going to call this James guy right now. I'm going to put in my offer. Buy, buy, buy. You can't fucking buy it. If you call my company trying to buy this property, we're going to know you're an idiot and you're not paying attention, bro. Because I'm telling you right here at the beginning of the fucking video, you can't buy this property unless you're my dude Chris, right? You see, I sent this to him privately, okay? And then... Only months and months after I sent it to Chris privately did I release it publicly on Holton Wise TV. I did that for two reasons. Number one, I fucking love money. And the more videos I put out there, the more investors can see what we're doing and are like, dude, that guy's really smart. I want to buy real estate in Cleveland. I'm going to do it through him. Right? I mean, that's obviously, you know, rule number one. Make money. But the second reason is, of course, to educate you all. Right? Because you know what? You don't have to buy through me. But I think if you watch a lot of these shows, you could really understand the Cleveland real estate market. And that's what this video is about. That's what it's all about. It's about teaching you guys the proper expectations of a real estate investor in the Cleveland market, right? So if you want to work with me like Chris is doing in this video, click the show notes under the video or send us an email, sales at holtonweiss.com. Give us your number. My team will call you, talk to you about working with me, mano a mano, getting videos like this for you, sent out privately in real time when the properties are still available, right? Because that's what Chris did. Now, Chris, brother, back to you. Dog. You're looking for that stable cash flow, and I know you like the Elyria area, the little suburb on the west end of town here, the west end of the greater Cleveland area. I love this one, brother. It's a quad quad that is priced at about the same price that a lot of the duplexes you and I have been looking at, right? Quad's not perfect, Chris. It's got some issues with it, okay? And I'm going to break down all of those, but I think even getting through all the issues, I think you've done enough property analysis videos with me to understand that, dude, this sucker is a screamer of a deal, even though it's going to take me a few years to stabilize it. So, Chris, let's look at every dollar coming in and out of this investment right now. Hi, I'm here for an interview. Hold my TV. Yep, take a seat with the other applicants. Thank you. Welcome. Welcome back. This is where we get into the meat, baby. This is where we figure out how the sausage is made. Now, I got to preface this by saying real estate is not always pretty, okay? This property is a stupid cheap price. Stupid, stupid. 
stupid cheap, okay? This is a quad in Illyria. This should probably sell for 200K, right? If it was taken care of uh, by somebody with, you know, some pride in their business, so to say, uh, this would be a $200,000 property, right? I actually love Illyria more than I love Cleveland, okay? Illyria, in my opinion, uh, the price points are much lower because uh, they're not focused on it. Nobody's like, I guess what I'm trying to say is like, you, you you Google articles and shit like this or shit like that, and people are like, where are the greatest real estate markets? And Cleveland's always popping up at the top. Like, best cash flow market, Cleveland, Cleveland, Cleveland. Cleveland Indians, Cleveland Cavs, Cleveland Browns, Cleveland Rock Hall, da 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 It's all Cleveland, 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 Cleveland. So, like, when we get investors, they reach out to us and people that buy in Northeast Ohio, it's Cleveland, Cleveland, Cleveland. They forget that, like, Cleveland is just like a teeny little thing in the greater Northeast Ohio Cleveland metro area, right? Like, Cleveland has got, like, I don't know, 360,000 uh, residents, okay? The greater Cleveland area, the area we service, is like 3 or 4 million or something like that, right? So Cleveland's a very small portion of it, but it takes uh, all, all the national spotlight and attention, okay? And, like, nobody has ever heard of Illyria, right, watching the show, right? Besides my show, have you ever heard of the city of Illyria before? Probably not, right? So it's very, very close to Cleveland. It's like 30-minute drive. It's right in our area, and nobody's paying attention to Illyria, and Illyria doesn't have, like, this swath, this nationwide, worldwide swath of investors coming in and battling each other over the properties. So uh, oftentimes, the prices are, are cheaper than they should be. Now, that said, they should not be 88900 for a goddamn quad, uh, but we're going to dive into to that in a second here, okay? So part of it is going to be that it's Illyria, not Cleveland itself. Uh, but the other part of it is going to be issues with this property, which we're going to be getting into. Now, one other thing that I think is important to mention, it's the quality of the neighborhood, right? Like, this is very similar to what you're going to see in some of the C-grade neighbors, neighborhoods of Cleveland, but I actually like Elyria a little bit better because I don't think the government's up your butt as much. It's a little bit more landlord-friendly than Cleveland. So I, I really actually think we get better returns in Elyria. So that said, the address, 427 West Ave, Elyria, 44035. On the market for 68 days, but that's misleading, okay? It was on the market, then off the market, on, off, right? Buyers flake all the time. Now, one of the first things I ever get when I'm dealing with rookie investors, when a property comes back on the market, they freak out. They're like, ah, James, why did it fall out of contract with the previous buyer? It's, it's red flags. I'm going to lose all my money. Ah, dude, settle down, folks. Settle down out there, okay? I've sold over $200 million worth of real estate investment in the greater Cleveland area, okay? That includes Cleveland and Elyria. Now, dealing with as many investment properties as I do, I am the number one seller of them in this market, I will tell you this. Most of you motherfuckers watching my show right now are flaky-ass sons of bitches, okay? If you're watching, you're sitting on your iPhone, like, I'd never flake on a deal, well, good for you. That's great. We want to talk to you. But uh, the moral of the story is the majority of you flake on deals. You guys flake all the time. Uh, part of that is why re uh, years ago I created the, uh, you know, business and purchasing structure that we have here at Holton Wise where you fucking pay me up front to do these videos for you, man. We don't uh, work with investors to help them navigate and find properties on the open market unless they pay up front, right? Because so many of you guys flake. And we'll even see you guys flake, put up non-refundable uh, earnest money, and then just like completely back out of the deal at the last minute. It, it just happens. It fl People flake, right? It's part of the game, right? It's built into our profit model, right? So I comprehend that. I get that. I'm part for the course. I know what's going on. So when you guys see a property where it came back on the market, don't always just assume it's got something to do with the property. More often Often than not, some fucking flaky asshole probably just backed out, right? That, that, that's just the name of the game. Now, assume but verify, though, right? We got to verify it, right? We're going to do independent verification on any property. We're going to do our own due diligence. So my show right here, yeah, this is the first step of the due diligence process. But after that, we're putting it contingent on a general home inspection. You're going to get a third-party home inspector. They're going to go through this thing, fine tooth comb, be there three, four hours, give you like a 90-page report, tell you everything that's wrong with the property. Outside of a major structural issue, I think there's going to be a bunch of shit wrong with the property, but you should fucking buy it. That's why it's so goddamn cheap. 
a structural issue would be reason not to do the deal. Like, because you couldn't fix the foundation of this home and make it cost prohibitive. You're looking at like 200 bucks a square foot. So that's what we're making sure. We're making sure we have no major structural issues. Other than that, you're going to see a lot of raggedy stuff, right? Because this is just a raggedy quad. It's got 410. It's already in there, right? So the price point has been beaten down. Because it's Lyria, people don't pay much attention. But, dude, it's just ghetto. Like, the neighborhood is nice. Like, this is probably the crummiest-looking uh, property in the area. It's just, like, you know, no driveway. You just got gravel. You got mixed match siding, fucking rugs hanging off the fucking porches. It's just, like, ugh, you know what I'm saying? It, it's just, like, not nice, right? You can see all the peeling paint. Like, the landlord just hasn't taken care of it, right? And you got four under-market tenants, right? You got... Two three ones, okay, and they're renting at five hundred and four fifty. Those folks should be renting at eight fifty a pop. And then the other two units, even though on the MLS here it's like listed as a one one, it's not a one one. It's a studio, and those are both renting at four hundred currently. But those should actually be renting at five hundred. So what you should really get here is twenty seven hundred dollars a month in rent. That would factor out to a little bit over thirty two for the year. Now. You don't get to keep all that, folks. If 27 came in, I'd anticipate you'd spend approximately 1100 or so operating this thing, including having my team do all the dirty work for you, leaving you with an NOI of approximately 15 hundo or 19 k or so for the year. As far as price, they are listed. Stupid cheap, okay? Even though I've talked about a lot of negatives with this. I still don't see a scenario where it actually sells at 88.9. I think there's still going to be a bidding war because, again, these are <laughs> you're normally looking at like $200,000 properties. So what we're going to do is still try to steal it, but we got to go above above list price to try to steal it. We're going to try to steal it at 100 Gs. That means you put down 25, 75 based on the mortgage, and if you had your market rents, that would project out to a 61% cash on cash return. Now, don't everybody go crazy just yet, because I don't think you're actually going to realize a real life 61% cash on cash return. Is it possible? Yes. But this goes to why the price is so cheap. To get a 61% average cash on cash return, what we need to do is we would need to take these tenants, okay? Mr. $500, Mr. 400, Mr. 400, Mr. 450. We would need to take them and get them all the way up to market rents, which would be, again, 850, 500, 500, 850. We do that with no turnovers. Boom. We're in the money. We should anticipate around 61% annualized cash on cash return estimates. But here's the reality, and this is why the, the, the seller is probably selling this. I don't believe we have any structural issues here. Of course, that would change the game. But what I think we just have here is just like a rundown, ghetto, crummy apartment building. And I think the landlord put in some ghetto, crummy, dirty tenants, right? I mean, you got like blankets hanging off the porches. It just looks gross. They're paying like little or no rent. Is it possible you can increase their rents to those market rates and none of them will move out and they'll continue to pay rent and everything's awesome and you're just raking in the cash? Yeah, that's possible. Uh, would I be... 100% honest with you, if I told you based upon my experience managing thousands and thousands of tenants, selling $200 million worth of real estate, that I think that's the most likely scenario? No, I'd be talking smoke. I'd be blowing smoke up your butt, talking out of mine, okay? I think what you're probably going to run into here is units that haven't been updated in a very, very long time and tenants that are tough and difficult to deal with, right? Maybe we evict a couple, maybe we don't. Maybe we get a couple up to market rent, maybe we don't, right? I'm, I'm guessing that these aren't like super rock star tenants, right? I'm guessing they're probably some fucking assholes, to be honest with you. Now, do I have like personal knowledge of these tenants? No. And it goes back to the rookie investors. Like, well, ask the seller if they're good tenants. Folks, I I've been doing this a very long time. And shockingly, Every single multifamily property I've ever dealt with. Somehow, the seller explained to me how they had these special tenants that were totally different than the average C-grade tenant that I normally see. Every single time. Okay, you get what I'm saying? Nobody's telling you, yeah, these tenants are horrible. I can't deal with it. I'm selling it. Right? Everybody's like, oh, these are the greatest tenants ever. They're so great. Look, I've been doing this a long time. I'm reading the tea leaves. I bet you we got difficult tenants here. Maybe they're amazing tenants. Unlikely, though, okay? We probably got difficult tenants to deal with, right? So maybe we got to turn some of them over on our way towards getting to that market rent estimate you see. And once we get up to that point, we're going to be able to do it cash or Section 8. Now, 
the units themselves, we don't have pictures of the inside of them, but, dude, I looked at the outside. I'm looking at the price. There's no scenario where any one of those four tenants moves out. We don't got to do a complete unit turn. Probably paint, floors, uh, probably go agreeable gray on the walls. If there's carpet, we remove it. If there's hardwood, we refinish it. Uh, if there's not hardwood, we put down vinyl allure. We're probably getting new Home Depot, Lowe's quality kitchen cabinetry and bathroom fixtures, right? So I would assume every turnover, we're probably looking at a ten to $20,000 bill, okay? When those four turnovers are going to occur, I do not know. I cannot predict it for you, right? I would anticipate over the first year of ownership, we do at least one. Over two years of ownership, I bet you we've done at least two. Five years from now, I don't know if we would have done all four. Maybe, maybe not. That's part of the game. Now, when you're buying these $200,000 duplexes or quads, rather, in the Cleveland market, right, oftentimes it's similar to this, right? Maybe not every unit needs a big old turn like that. Not every unit's this far under market. But don't think that, like, the $200,000 ones are, like, 100% freshly renovated, things of that nature, right? You're still dealing with some level of distressed uh, real estate. I don't know if distress is the right word, but you're dealing with some level of, like, older stuff and inherited tenants living in units that will need to be turned. I mean, essentially, when you're dealing with C-grade stuff, guys, you're turning old, you're, every time you do a turnover, you're doing uh, some type of renovation in there. Maybe you're not kitchens and baths, but you're probably repainting every time, right? Uh, we like to do the vinyl allure or the wood floors so you don't have to add on that carpet cost every time. But there's always some type of rehab involved, right? So at the end of the day, uh, this property for its issues and for the fact that when you get your inspection report, I don't anticipate uh, anything being brand new in there. I anticipate you seeing some ugly looking units. I'm sure the furnaces and the hot water tanks in this building are quite old. Uh, but again, you're not really buying any quad where they're all brand new, right? Furnaces, for example, they last 30 years. They cost about three grand to replace. If I am a real estate uh, investor, I am, but in this scenario, I'm hypothetically one, okay? and I have a furnace that works, and it's 22 years old. They typically last 30 years, and I'm ready to sell my property. I'm not going to replace it. It works. You as a buyer should assume you got about eight years of life, uh, reasonable life left into it before you replace it, right? I mean, that's how it works. I know we get a lot of people that come here, and, and they've only ever, like, listened to turnkey guru type stuff, and they, and they think that there's going to be this, like, market of like fully renovated properties. That doesn't make any sense. Who would do that? Why would you throw out a furnace that's probably going to last another eight years? It just doesn't make sense, right? So if and when we get to the point where we get the inspection report back and you see that the furnaces, your inspector, he's going to say something like, uh, furnaces, past useful life expectancy, recommend HVAC person checks them out. That just means they're fucking old, and when they finally do break down, you got to replace them. Cost to do, it's going to be about three Gs. Same thing for the hot water tanks, except for those last about 15 years, cost about a G. The roof, it's probably a good $10,000 roof. Those are supposed to last 30 years. We want to see where we're at with life expectancy on that, but I would imagine we're at least 15, 20 years old on that as well, right? These are all things to be expected. That's why you get to pick the property up for about $100,000, right? So just as long as we are all on the same page of what exactly we're getting, the thing is still going to be all friggin' cash cow, and eventually you're going to get it up to 2700 a month, right? When I invest in real estate, the number one thing I like to look at is quadrupling my money. You put down 25%, the bank kicks in 75%. It's a 30-year low-interest tax-deductible loan, okay? The only negative to that is you only get 10 of those loans. So if I'm only going to be able to get 10 loans... Do I want to get 10 quads and bring in 40 rental income checks a month? Or do I want to get 10 single family homes and bring in 10? I would prefer to collect 40 rental income checks than 10. Although I'm not going to lie, I think you as an investor should only do the numbers based on 36 income checks and 9 rental income checks, right? Because I don't think you should use your 10 mortgages on 10 investment properties. You should utilize your first mortgage on your own home. Take care of home base first, right? So that would be 9 quads at 36 rental income checks versus uh, 9 single families at 9. But that's just a real estate investment strategy thing that I believe. So that, folks, is my thoughts on this property. I absolutely think it's a go. But if you're someone who's going to be scared or freaked out uh, by an uh, inspection report that shows you, like, oh, th this is not totally brand new, the same for you, right? You don't have to fix every single thing that's listed on that report. You want to fix it to meet all the local uh, local, state, and federal housing codes, but you're going to see deferred maintenance on all these properties. And just this one in particular, I imagine you're going to see a little bit more because it looks like it's been pretty 
it's been road rough and put away wet, if you know what I mean. But still a lot of money to be made. Let me know what you want to do. Thanks for watching. Subscribe to Holton Wise TV for more financial information, education, and entertainment.